Oh, man. Good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing? Bro, you brought me Starbucks? You're freaking awesome. Get up for Daniel Workman. He's the best around here. He's the freaking GOAT. Man, I'm excited about today. I'm excited about this morning. It's Super Bowl Sunday, so, and we have a packed house. Look at that. So that tells me two things. Your team either did not make it to the Super Bowl or you could care less about it. So either way, I'm glad you're here this morning. Um, I'm ready to have a good time with you guys. So as you guys can tell, Camp 22 is just a few months away. It's crazy to think that we're already in February. Like February 2022, it's so wild, but camp is coming. Um, last year, we launched our first youth camp, uh, got, got the opportunity to host our own camp. Multiple churches from town came, had fun with us, and it was a great experience. My life was changed at camp. I'm a product of camp, so I believe in it, and I'm excited about it. So registration is launching this week, and you know we'll be talking about it more you know, in, in, in the upcoming weeks. But real quick, too, a little plug. We have what we call crew nights every single week, so if you have a junior high or a high school student, please come talk to us afterwards at the next, step, next Steps table. We'd love to get them connected to what we have going on. I got to shout out Via Youth real quick because they are the greatest people on the planet. They make my job so fun, and, and it's crazy because I've been doing this for 10 years now, and, you know, I started when I was 12, so, like, you know, you do the math. It's been, I just don't age, and the reason why I'm not aging is because I hang out with the youth, so I, I love them. Um, it's, they just make my life so much better, um, and yeah, so, but I'm excited for today. Um, I want to shout out one more person, my beautiful wife. She's somewhere over here, and yep, she's right here. Where's she at? Right there. Um, <laughs> And I, here's the thing, been doing this for 10 years now, right? There's absolutely no way I can do this without someone like her. Like, and, and it's Valentine's Day tomorrow, so I just want to say that I love you. I appreciate you. Thank you for giving me the best two kids in the whole wide world. Um, you see how I'm making her blush? You see what I'm doing? Take some notes, guys. This is how you do it. The day before, you just put the spot on her and you just love on her. But I love you, and I'm so grateful for you. And God is so good for allowing me to marry you up. Can I get an amen? So, all right, so I'm excited about today's word. I'm going to go ahead and pray, and we're going to kick, uh, just kind of dive in. So, God, right now, I just thank you for what you're going to do in this place. God, your, your scripture, scripture teaches us that no one comes to you unless the spirit draws them. So I thank you for drawing us to this place today. God, I believe that you're going to do a work within our hearts, a work that's deeper than what we anticipate. But God, I pray that you would bring understanding as I'm communicating what you've put in my heart. I thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I already need water, guys. 9, 9 a.m., it was fun. I just, I'm surprised I have a voice right now. I don't know how I have one, but thank God. So don't mind me. I'm going to have to take a sip. But I'm excited about today. Um, I'm really what I want to do in this moment is just take all of you on a journey that I've been on the last few months. The last few months, I've been asking this question. I've been asking this question to God. It's like, God, why are churches becoming unhealthy? Yeah, we're going to talk this morning. I, I was asking God, God, why are church leaders not finishing strong? There's a statistic out there that only 5% of pastors finish strong. They start good in ministry, but they don't finish strong. I started asking this question, God, why are people, your people, Christians, renouncing their faith and walking away from the local church? I started wrestling with this, and it started breaking my heart because I have family members. I have people that used to be in ministry that are no longer in ministry. I have church leaders that I highly admire that have, have fallen because of moral failures and, and so many different things. I, I just... Friends that have walked away from the faith because of church hurt and things that they've gone through. I've seen a lot of stuff, and I've been asking this question, God, why? Why is this happening? Why is this happening? And I begin, as I begin to ask my questions, God answered my prayer by dropping a question in my heart. And he said this, what would my people look like if they understood that they had access, access to the fullness of my nature, and the ability to operate in overflow. The ability to operate in overflow. John 10.10, 10, there's a scripture that I want to open up with today. That says this, the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus in the same scripture says, but I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. The Amplified reads like this. It says, I have come to give you life and life till it overflows. My hope for you today is to leave today believing 
that you can have access to a life that overflows. I don't know if you know this, but you are in a fight right now. The enemy, we have an enemy. His plan, like I said, is to kill, steal, and destroy your purpose, to keep you from the things that God has called you to do. That's his plan. So his plan, the way he executes that plan is by filling you up with the wrong stuff, feeding you the wrong things. The problem that we're seeing in our world right now is so many people, Christians, all of us, we tend to live on this side of the track closer to being empty than to being full. This is the problem that we're seeing right now. Indicators, real quick. I'm going to be, I'll, I'll talk about me because you guys are perfect. I'll talk about me, all right? Indicators of somebody not being full of God. It usually goes like this. This is the language, some indicators for you just to understand what I'm saying. An indicator will go like this. You see your problem, and you're so zoomed in on your problem that you magnify it above Jesus. You make your problem large and your Jesus small. It's, it's, that's an indicator of not being full. Another indicator, I'll talk about me. A few years ago, I have a seven-year-old. If you have a seven-year-old, you'll know where I'm going with this. I was hanging out at home, and this kid just came out of nowhere. I was shirtless, just, just at home, and bah, just slaps my back. And I'm telling you what came out of me, I didn't cuss. I didn't do any of that. I'm, I'm, I'm holy. I tried to be holy. But what came out of me was my preacher's will. I scared this kid so bad. I was like, I felt so bad in that moment. God was speaking to me. Why did you get mad, son? It was just a slap by a seven-year-old. Like, why? It's like you, when you're, when you're not operating in overflow, it's easy for you, easy for you to fly off the handle. We have attitudes. We start gossiping. We start easy indicators. That's the language that I'm trying to communicate to you today. And I'm here to tell you, really inspire you, encourage you, that you have access to this life that God came to give you. And that access leads to overflow. There's a, there's a story in the Bible that I want to read to you that I feel has a few things that we could all learn from and and really get, that just gives us a picture of one of the first miracles that Jesus performed when we saw this concept of overflow. And that's in John chapter 6. I'm going to read it to you. There's a few scriptures. Um, and this story, many of you might be familiar with this, Jesus feeding the 5,000. And it's an incredible story. You might have heard messages on the, uh, uh, in your past about it. But, but I'm going to go ahead and just read this to you and pull out some truths from it. In uh, chapter 6, verse 1, it goes like this. After this, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Then Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover, Passover celebration. Verse 5, Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Verse 7, Philip replied, even if we work for months, we won't have enough money to feed them. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Verse 10, tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The man also numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, gave them to them, to the people. Afterwards, he did the same thing with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. Verse 12, after everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, now gather the leftovers, hello overflow, so that nothing is wasted. Last scripture. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left over by the people. Overflow. 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 This is the language of today's message. Overflow. See, in this story, there's a few characters that I want to highlight. Of course, you got Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, our Savior. You have the crowds, people flooding to come see Jesus. You have disciples that are around Jesus. And then you have this little boy, this little boy. I believe there's three things that I want to teach you today from this story. Three things that I've, I'd like to be honest with you guys, I've never seen before. I've read the story multiple times, and I've never seen what I'm about to share with you. Three principles that I believe talk about overflow. I believe show you how you can live a life that overflows with Jesus and who he is. 
the first thing that we see in the story is number one. This little boy was prepared. This little boy was prepared. Think about that. 5,000 people in this place, in this event, and only one boy was prepared with two fish and five loaves of bread, five slices of bread. One of the best things that I've been doing over the course of the last few years is practicing getting into the Bible story, trying to feel what they felt, trying to understand the theme and what, what was going on in that, in that moment. One little boy was the only one who was prepared. If you're going to live a life, if you're going to live the life that Jesus came to give you, then you're going you're to have to learn how to prepare so my question to you is, how do you prepare? What do you, what's your preparation life look like right now? What, is, what, what are you doing in private? I'm going to tell you something. Your private life matters. Your life is a direct result of what you do in private. It, it matters. It's always going to come out with our students. The last two weeks, we've, we've, I, start, I, I introduced this series and titled it Normalize the Talk. Teaching a generation to normalize talking about your struggle. Because no matter what, at one point or another, you're going to have to talk about it. The question is, when do you want to have that talk? Do you want to have that talk while you're in your struggle and you can find help and, and, and be redeemed and, and let God come on the scene? Like, do you want to talk about your struggle while you're on this side? Or do you want to talk about the struggle while you're on this side? When you fall, when you make the mistake, when you're full of shame, when you're full of guilt, when you're full of condemnation. We've been teaching the students this the last few weeks, and, and it all has to, it all comes back to how you're preparing. Your private life matters. What you do in secret matters. There's a devil in John 10.10 10 that we learn about who's after you. He wants to kill. He wants to steal. He wants to destroy. And this is his plan. So my question to you is, how are you preparing? What steps are you taking to prepare? Out of everybody in this story, this boy was prepared. There's three quick steps that I want to give you when it comes to preparation. Step number one is this. You have to first and foremost develop a relationship with Jesus. If you've never met Jesus, if you're here for the very first time, we will give you that opportunity after the service. And we'll have people praying for you. And we, we can make that moment happen where you accept Jesus into your heart. But it starts there. You start developing a relationship with Jesus. The second step that you do, you start opening up this book. Listen. When I'm 90, I'm going to be reading this book, and this book is not going to change. But when I'm 90, this book is still going to have the power to change me. It's, it's not. It's, God is the same God. So the way, the way you prepare is by opening up this book and finding out what he said about you, finding out how much he loves you, finding out how the purpose and the plan that he has for you. This, this book is the manual to success. This is, there's everything that you need in this book. This is how we prepare. The third thing, you find community. You find people who are going to rally around you. I'm going to say this. There's no way you'll drown in life if you're coming to this church. Why? Because we have a community of people who love you, who are going to fight for you. We're going to walk by side with you. We're going to pray for you. So I encourage you, join to be alive. Take your next steps. That's not just a plug of like, hey, get in groups. Like, no, like I'm telling you, it'll literally change your life. You need the right people in your life. You've heard this. I've heard this. You are who you hang out with. And it doesn't matter if you're 12, doesn't matter if you're 50, doesn't matter if you're 60, doesn't matter if you're 30. Age does not matter. You will become who you hang out with. Prepare. Prepare. How, how's your preparation looking like? You know, it's Valentine's Day tomorrow, right? So I'm going to give you a quick little, I'm going to encourage all my singles real quick. All of my singles in this place, make some noise. Oh, there's a, it, that was either a courtesy, like, woo, or there's some singles in this place. Either, either way, that's good. But listen, this whole idea of preparation, like I was the king, the king of dysfunctional relationships. Kid you not, since kinder, I remember in kinder kissing the girl. Like, I, I'm not lying. Like, I literally, and I thought it was the coolest thing. I was like, man, I just kissed her. Boy tries kissing my three-year-old, he's going to just thank God for mercy, right? Uh, but, but I was the king of dysfunctional relationships. I destroyed every relationship I was in. 
I was, I was that guy that every preacher preaches about not to date. I was that guy. Thank God for redemption. And, and here's the thing. When it comes to this idea of pre- preparation and preparing, I want to encourage you singles, embrace your singleness. Prepare. I finally got to this place in my life where I was tired. I was like, dude, I, I, I'm destroying every relationship. I, I just, it, nothing's going good. I just, I, I'm messing everything up. I'm hurting people. I'm breaking hearts. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the man that I'm supposed to be. I'm not treating women with respect. I'm not, I'm not doing, I, I, I'm not that person. God is starting to teach me that I can be something different, how a man is supposed to treat a woman, how a man is supposed to love a woman. And like, I, I started learning of all this, and I finally said, God, you know what? I give up. I give up. You do you. I'm going to take a step back, and I want you to do what you do best. And then for three and a half years, I went into a season of not dating anybody. Not a text, not a call, not a hangout. Guys, I was so legalistic. I would go eat by myself. I'd go to the movies by myself. And, and I finally got to this place, and here, this place, and this is your encouragement for you singles real quick. I finally got to this place where I was like, God, I kind of like this. I'm content. If it's me and you and you and me, like, I'm good. Like, this, this actually feels good. And then he says the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life a few months later, I said, dude, I love you. Start dating. A year after that, I propose. Three months after that, I get married. Boom. What happens? When you give in to your preparation and you prepare well, God does this. It always feels like he's pulling you back, almost like a slingshot. He's pulling you back, and it makes no sense. It, 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 it really, honestly, it sucks. It, it doesn't feel good. Can I say suck at church? I don't know, but I said it. <laughs> Pull back. And and it doesn't feel good, but the moment that you reach contentment and you're so sold out to your preparation, he pulls you back and then he propels you forward. But most times we settle. You can clap if you want. Sorry, I'm just just fired up. But most times, most times we end up settling because we don't know what to do with our preparation time. I'm telling you, what you do in secret matters. Sow the good seeds. Your life, your life deserves for you to sow the right kind of seeds. My kids, my marriage, my family, they need me to to sow in this preparational season the right kind of seeds. Because the Bible says that God will not be mocked. Whatever you sow, you will also reap. So sow good seeds. This little boy was prepared. If you're going to live a life, Live the life that God said you can live, a life that overflows in the fullness of Jesus' nature, then you're going to have to prepare. The second thing that we see in this story, I'm going to take a drink. Can I take a drink? Thanks. Um, The second thing that we see in this story is that this little boy, he was in close proximity to Jesus. He was in close proximity to Jesus. What does that mean? Think about this. Again, get into the story with me. 5,000 people. In fact, scholars believe that there was over 15,000 people because they only counted the men back then. Why? I don't know. Don't, I'm just a messenger. 15,000 people, one little boy. I hate crowds. Tomorrow, I love her. She loves me. But we're not going anywhere. Why? Because Valentine's Day is crazy. Hey, uh, can I make a reservation? Nope, sorry. You should have done that three months ago. It's like, it's... <laughs> It takes forever. Like, I can't even go through McDonald's. Like, it's like the line is long. You know, like, it's like, not that I would. I'm not cheap, guys. I'm not, I'm not cheap. But I hate crowds. I hate lines. It's like, it's going to take forever. Imagine this little boy, a little boy. Imagine your little boy if you have one. Your nephew, your cousin, that little boy. Out of 15,000 people, he still managed to sneak and get within proximity of Jesus. My question to you is, who are you following? Who are you following? And is is the person or the thing that you're following right now, is that producing the life that you want to live? A lot of us get caught up with different things in our world. They capture our attention and we start following it. I tell our teenagers all the time, this whole social media influencer thing, you get so caught up in it. You start following it. What are you following? And and is what you're following producing the life that you want to live? Follow Jesus in close proximity. This is how you know. This is the language of you knowing an indicator that you're following Jesus in close proximity. When life is good, 
and life is bad, the first one you talk to is Jesus. When, when you're going through it and you don't know what you're going to do, the first one you talk to is Jesus. When you need to cry and you need somebody to hold you, the first one you run to is the presence of Jesus. It's, it's Jesus-centered. Everything is Jesus before you do anything else. That's the language. Those are indicators of you being close to Jesus. When, 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 when sickness comes and knocks at your door, the first thing that you do is, I'm going to pray in Jesus' name. My Jesus took stripes upon his back, so I believe in healing, so I'm going to declare healing, and I'm going to speak this over my child. I'm going to speak this over my family. I'm going to speak this over the situation. And then you grab the medicine. That's not a lack of faith. That's you simply believing that Jesus can do it all. And it's an indicator of you following Jesus step by step. If you're going to live this life that Jesus came and died for, died to give you, you're going to have to follow him closely. You're going to have to stay within close proximity. I'm going to tell you a secret. And this is not easy for me to say, but Sunday, coming to church on Sunday is good. And it's great. But if you're not doing anything with your Monday through Saturday, this is all for nothing. You're not close to Jesus. If you get caught up serving on Sunday all day, that's great. We want you to do that. But if you don't do anything with your Monday through Saturday, it's all for nothing. Jesus came to give you overflow. Jesus came to give you overflow. You have access to that. And if you're going to follow Jesus, and if you want this kind of life, you're going to have to follow him closely. Follow him closely. Proximity is a byproduct of your preparation time. When you can do this, when you can prepare, right, when you can follow, when you can accept Jesus, and you do the things that I talked about, you join, you find community, you find out what God says about you, when you do all that, that's going to create a hunger for you to follow Jesus close. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to encourage you, it's going to inspire you to fight for encounters with Jesus daily. I love that our pastor said that last week. We can't live on yesterday's encounters. They're not good enough. Jesus is good enough. But those encounters, like I need Jesus to touch me every single day of my life. I can't wait for a Sunday experience. I can't do that. If you're going to live this, follow him closely. That's what the little boy teaches us. The third thing that we learn in this story is my last point. Well, technically my last point, but I have more. Third thing, I want you to catch this. I am a preacher by heart, and I'm finally accepting that. If you notice, there's three Ps that I'm giving you. The first one was, hit me with it, prepare. The second one was proximity. The third one is this little boy understood his purpose. You see that? See how we're pushing P around it? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Edit that online. Forget that I said that. I love you guys. I just had to drop that for my teenagers in the front. But he was... He, he was, he understood his purpose. He understood his purpose. 5,000 people, 15,000 people, crazy event. And somehow, someway, this little boy understood his purpose. Now, what is his purpose? I imagine this little boy, I, I just imagine him when I was reading the text, I was like, man, you know what? There was another little boy in the Bible who carried cheese and bread to a war zone that positioned him to slay a giant. So I wonder, what if this little boy in John, what if somehow, some way, he got, he got a hold of the scrolls of Samuel, and he read the story, and he started preparing. He's like, man, it's, if, if God did this for David, and, then, and I see what David did, and I see what God did through David, man, what, what if he can do that for me? And then because of it, what if, what if he started following Jesus with the, like, just proximity, just closely, what, what, if, what if that happened? Like, I, I believe that somehow, some way, this kid knew. He had been seeing. In this moment, he knew that Jesus was coming. He heard, man, this Jesus who's been performing miracles, who's been raising the dead, who's been turning water into wine. I mean, I'm not old enough to drink, but whatever. Like, that's so cool. Like, what if this little boy, what if this little boy was seeing all of that? The reason why I believe that he understood his purpose it's because he's a little boy. He left his house, grabbed some fish, grabbed some bread, and went after Jesus. Now, the purpose that I'm talking about here, 
This little boy, I believe, understood these two things, that he understood that his purpose in life was to serve and follow Jesus. That's it. We're not here to achieve things. We're not here to build up a crazy good life so we can flaunt it on Instagram. Like, we're not, we're not here to do any of that. All of that is a byproduct of seeking and following Jesus. Matthew 6, if you seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, all these things will be added unto you. God wants to give you that stuff, but he wants to be first. Question is, is he first in your life? Do you understand that that is your purpose? No matter your age, that is your purpose. Your purpose is to serve and love Jesus outside of this space. Outside of this space. He wants to spend time with you. He wants to know you on, in, a, in a deeper way. Guys, I, I, this was not my plan for my life. I wasn't raised in the church. It took me two years to show up to you. I, I didn't want to do this. This wasn't my plan. My plan is Super Bowl Sunday. My plan was to play in the Super Bowl. Yeah, I, I get it. I'm short, but I was fast. 4'4", 40, as a sophomore in high school. Benching 345 pounds, killing it. Yeah, I'll brag on me a little bit, all right? That was my dream. My dream was to play football. I, that was my out of my, of my living situation. This, this is what I wanted to do, but God somehow, some way, had a plan for me to preach on Super Bowl Sunday on February, whatever today is, of 2022, and here I am today. Why? Because I understood. When I started following Jesus, I understood that, man, man, man I got I to gotta follow these three pieces. I, there's something about but just preparing and just f figuring out who God says, that, like what he says that I can do and who I am to him. I got to prepare for what God has called me to do. And what did I start doing? I started following him and staying close, and, and God, what do you... I, like, where are you? wherever you go, I go. God, send me. I'm right here. Like, I want to be with you. And then I, I'm at this place in my life where I fully understand my purpose. Fully understand my purpose. And what I want to encourage you with is that what God has done for me, he wants to do in you and through you. God is no respecter of person. God doesn't have favorites. If, if, if he has a picture in his refrigerator in heaven, guess what? Your picture's on there. That's a big refrigerator. It's a huge one. To prepare, this little boy showed us that he understood his purpose. He understood his purpose. I'm going to go ahead and invite the band to come back up. You know, as I was preparing all this, I'm like, man, why does all this matter? This is what I do. I'm going to teach you something. Every time you hear the word of God, every time you hear a message, go back and do the research for yourself. Even if it's coming from a pastor. Go back and do the research for yourself. After putting all of this together, I'm like, why does this all matter, God? Like, like, show me. Why does this matter? And I realized this. I realized that when you or when God, when he finds a person, when he finds somebody who's willing to prepare, when he finds someone who's willing to follow him closely, within close proximity, when he finds somebody who's willing to understand their purpose in life, that person is a person who carries the rhythm of revival on the inside of their hearts. I'm tired of playing church. I don't, I, I don't, want, I don't want to do anything. I don't want to be a pastor. I don't want to be in ministry if I don't have Jesus. I don't want to go through this life if I don't have Jesus. I don't want to take another step if I don't have Jesus. My marriage won't work without Jesus. My kids won't work without Jesus. My life will fall apart if Jesus is not in the center. And that's my encouragement to all of you. Why does this matter? We've been talking about revival the last few weeks. And I believe with everything in me that God is looking for a church to believe in this, to fight for this. Our Jesus the Jesus that we run to, the Jesus that we worship, the Jesus that we love, did crazy, amazing things in the Bible. Raised the dead, cast out demons, healed the sick, miracles, died a crazy criminal's death, took stripes upon his back, rose again from the grave, like this is Jesus. And then he has the audacity to say this, guess what? I did all these great things. I am the son of God. 
I am the King of Kings. And yet, yet, in John he says, but greater works shall all of you do if you believe in me. Greater works. We're talking about healing. Yeah, we're talking about the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. He has feelings. The Bible calls him the advocate, the counselor. He, he stands in a gap for you. He pleads for you. He prays for you. This Holy Spirit, this small, still voice is in your heart. The minute that you say yes to Jesus, that voice comes alive. And that same voice is the voice that's encouraging you, that's reminding you there's more for your life. You're being robbed. God has so much more. God has so much more. I'm going to ask you guys to stand on your feet. We're going to get into worship because I feel like God wants to do something during this session. I need it. Like, guys, like, hear me out. John 10.10. 10. You've been lied to. Yeah, the enemy's been after you. Yeah, life has been hard. Life is not easy. I'm not discrediting that. But I choose to focus on the side that says that Jesus came to give me life. Even during the hard times, he somehow, someway came to give me life. And life that overflows. Parents in this room, your kids need you to operate in overflow. They need you to operate in overflow. This generation, this upcoming generation, Gen Z and Gen Alpha that's falling right after them. They need you to operate in overflow. Why? There's stats out there that say that these, these kids, these students, this upcoming generation, they've seen too much fake. They had parents live one way on Sunday and live a completely different life Monday through Saturday. And they're questioning, why, God? Why? Like, if, if you're really real, why is this happening? Parents, our kids, your kids, my kids, they need us to live in overflow. They need us to fully tap into the life that Jesus said we can have. <laughs> Spouses in this room, your spouse needs you to operate in overflow. They need you to tap into that. Because if the, if, if the enemy can get into your household and he can mess within your marriage, if he messes with your marriage and he has your kids, and hear me out, God is a restorer, he's a redeemer, and I love that about him. But he, I, I gotta tell you the truth, we gotta fight for overflow, we can prevent all that. The local church can change the, the, the stats in our world. Like we have the ability to change that. Our world needs you to operate in overflow. Business owners, your employees need you to operate in overflow. Too many people are hurt. Too many people are not willing to listen to the message of Christ because they're hurt. They're depending on you. The Bible says that God sends laborers into the harvest field. The harvest is ready. He's just looking for people to say, hey, God, send me, I'll go. Yeah, I run this business. God, send me, I'll go. Show me how to tap into overflow, God, because I want my employees to know that I love them and I care about them. I'm not just their boss. I'm not just their manager. I love them. I'm a representation of who Christ is. Everybody around you, your life would look different if you lived and accessed this life that Jesus came to give you. He wants this for you. There's some of you in this room that are wrestling with this thought. Well, I'm not. I can't. Like, like I, 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 I already went through all that. I, I, I screwed up. I made my mistakes. Like, can God really use me? The answer is yes. The Bible says that he used Jacob. He used David. He used Moses, the murderer. David killed a giant, but then raped a girl. Somehow, some way, God still used that. He used Peter, who was a liar. He used Matthew, the tax collector. He used Paul. Paul was literally killing Christians, going after them, but somehow, some way, he got a hold of him. And Paul wrote three-fourths of the New Testament, established a local church. Is it too late for you? No. God's got a plan, and his plan never fails. You have to be willing to say yes. Say yes. Just say yes. My hope for you today as we begin to worship is that you would understand this and you would fight for this. 
You would bleed for this. You would die for this. You would just want everything that Jesus has for you. If you want to follow Jesus, surrender to this. What are you currently holding on to? What are you holding on to? Let it go. Fully surrender to God. The most beautiful part about this story that I wish I could have seen was the little boy taking his two fish, taking his five slices of bread, and saying, God, this is all I got. I, I, I know there's 15,000 people here, but this is all I got. But something in him said, it's better to take what's in my hands and put it in the hands of the King of Kings, to put it in the hands of the Lord of Lords, to put it in the hands of my miracle maker, to put it in the hands of the lily of the valley, to put it in the hands of the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end and everything in between. Let go of what you're holding on to. God's got a plan for you, and I promise you, with conviction in my heart, God will turn it around. So let's, raise, let's just raise our hands. I'm going to pray for you. This is my prayer for you. When God gave me this whole message, I don't see visions in so, so much. I have had a few. But I saw this. When God downloaded this message into my heart, I saw him taking what looked like a pitcher of water. And this pitcher of water, what he was doing, he was pouring it out over his people, a room just like this. He was pouring out his love to those that feel that they're not lovable. He was pouring out his mercy to people that feel that they don't deserve it. He was pouring out his grace for people who want to give up and throw in the towel. He was pouring out his spirit. And my prayer today in this moment, God, would you do that? Would you pour out your spirit upon all flesh like you said you would? God, fill our hearts with your love. Fill our hearts with your mercy. Fill our hearts with your grace. Fill our hearts with your spirit. God, do what you said you would do. Do what you came here to do. A life that overflows. Jesus, would you do that in Jesus' name? Let's worship, guys. Let's worship together.